This presentation is part of the Integrating Water and Coastal Dataset session. Um, I'm going to be presenting a, an Australian EO product that we're developing here um, called DEA Coastlines that looks at the history of coastal trains across Australia. So my name is Stephen Sager. I lead the aquatic development team uh, within Digital Earth Australia. We develop a range of different products in the aquatic and marine space. Commonality is they all leverage the uh, rich archive of available, uh, publicly available EO data sources. So firstly, this is a collaborative project with a bunch of people in our group. Um, Robbie Bishop-Taylor largely leads the technical component of this work as myself, Rachel Nansen, who's our coastal geomorphologist, and also Leo Limburner. The brief presentation outline, I'm going to talk a little bit about Digital Earth Australia in a, in a data cube context and what analysis ready data means. Look at coastal regions and how they align with some of the geo priorities. Then talk about some of the DEA coastal products that we developed over the last couple of years and how we're looking at moving more to monitoring a dynamic coast. Now I'm going to introduce the product in question, which is DA Coastlines, look at the method and a few of our examples, and then talk about some future work we're doing, trying to link that to coastal change and to different kind of environmental drivers. So Digital Earth Australia really kicked off when the USGS released the uh, public available uh, Landsat data back in 2009. And this first prototype uh, was called the Australian Geoscience Data Cube, and this was a collaborative project within Australia. And this developed into the Open Data Cube Initiative. And Digital Earth Australia is the government, Australian government implementation of the ODC. So we also support other global ODC initiatives, such as Digital Earth Africa, which we'll talk a little bit about later. Now, the DA model, uh, really the crux of, of what we do is leveraging this deep continental scale of time series data. We do that on high performance computing facilities, either physical or in the cloud um, increasingly. And the important part about this is the use of standardised analysis-ready data. So we, we standard um, process our data to surface reflectance. We have our quality controls like cloud masking and pixel quality, essentially looking to take away all of those variables out of Earth observation data, which present, prevents people to, to easily go through and analyse it. And you can see in the animation on the right here, as we sort of um, move into the Sentinel era, our aim is to have these different data uh, sources from different sensors like closely integrated so they can add value to environmental interpretation. We have this all on an analytical platform, which enables people to come to the data, write code, we deliver products, they can interact with those. So we really want to make break down these barriers for, for industry and people and government to get in and use this data. So how do coastal regions relate to the geo initiatives that we're looking at here or the priorities? So globally, 40% of the world's population lives within 100 kilometres of the coast. And in Australia, this increases to about 85% of our population within about 50 k's of the coast. So I guess at this point, uh, it's worth saying, look, these products are Australia-centric. We developed in Australia. But being on an ODC platform, um, we are looking to take them um, internationally. So people should look at these in context, I guess. Now, 10% of the world's population live in coastal areas less than 10 metres above sea level, and even more in uh, developing island nations. In terms of these geo-engagement priorities, these places are in risk from climate change, they must more susceptible to disaster impacts such as storm surge. So knowing more about the coastline in these areas is critical to understanding that risk and how we move forward with that. And these regions are under increased pressure from population growth and development. And as part of the Geo Canberra Declaration, there was discussions around recognising the significantly increased risk of these island nations. And some of the data sets we're going to be looking at here are easily applicable to those kind of countries. Products we've already developed over the last couple of years, we developed a national intertidal digital elevation model called NIDAM. This uses the uh, full 30 years of the Landsat archive across Australia. We developed an intertidal elevation model out of that, so essentially a DEM that takes care of that intersection between land and sea, that exposed intertidal surface that traditionally is really hard to, to survey uh, using traditional methods. And this uh, product has managed to um, increase the interface, uh, to improve that interface, so for things like inundation modelling, you have a, more, a much better transition from land through to sea. We also have a couple of image products, which we call the high and low tide composite products. Uh, essentially, these are composites made at high and low tide, which give a cloud and noise-free visualisation of the coastline across Australia at these sort of different environmental epochs, which are really important for habitat modelling, habitat monitoring and mapping. But those were static products, and we have a change in coastline, so we need a dynamic product. And this has been in the news a lot in Australia recently. We've had some areas which are already subject to erosion and this has been exacerbated by, by big storm events um, near infrastructure, near roads and homes. We've also had environmental impacts from things like mangrove dieback where this uh, can exacerbate erosion. We need methods that can monitor a, a dynamic coast. 
and even in a simple form for estuaries like you can see in the graphic on the right here these are constantly changing and for environmental managers of estuary health and things like this we need an efficient way to be able to monitor these through time and ongoing So when we talk of applying this kind of method to a continent the size of Australia, we talk about an issue of scale. Um, and this is both from a temporal scale, we want to be able to leverage this time series and from a temporal perspective. We want to be able to do things at a continental scale. Australia is a big country. And we want to make use of this public EO data. But often that means we're making a sacrifice in terms of spatial resolution. And you can see at the bottom left here, you can see high resolution data from somewhere like a private satellite like Worldview. And the amount of detail we lose when we move to these public good satellites and sometimes this isn't going to be enough to pick up those fine scale changes in the coast. So we developed a sub-pixel method which is able to drive shoreline sub-pixel from Landsat uh, 30 meter data and on the panels on the right here you can see the orange line which represents a shoreline which we would drive from standard Landsat if we were to stick with the pixel based method. The blue line is our sub-pixel derived shoreline and it uh, correlates very well with a, a high resolution shoreline so we're quite confident we had something in this approach. We did some prototype testing. Um, there was a, a location in Australia called Narrabeen Beach in Sydney, and that's had an extensive monitoring campaign that you don't often get for the last 30 odd years. And this is a beach that is neither eroding or accreting, there's just some natural variability going on. You can see from the panel in the middle there that our shorelines that we've derived, the 30 shorelines over 30 years, all fall within 30 metres, so one Landsat pixel. So we need to know whether or not what we're picking up with this shoreline change is actually something, you know, is, is real life or whether it's just something from our modelling. And compared to the validation data we have at Narrabeen, you can see we, we've gotten quite good results and we were, we were quite surprised when these came out of the process. So the yellow section you can see running through the middle of this graph is actually the width of a Landsat pixel and you can see that we're quite effectively picking up change sub-pixel that correlates with this validation data. So this gave us the, the impetus to move forward to a national product. I'll just quickly step through how we scaled that up. So a lot of our work um, in DEA or in the coastline space look, works with tidal attribution. So this is using the Oregon State tidal model. So the first thing we do, we've gone through and we've attributed every pixel um, through time and space. So for Australia, through 30 years of Landsat data, that's a lot of pixels with a tidal height attribution. So what was the tidal height when this pixel was acquired? And you can see that with the, the yellow dots down there on the tidal, um, the tidal uh, graph down the bottom. After that, we've gone and masked out pixels, which are within 25, beyond 25% of um, the, the tidal range that we've seen, so the extremes. What that means is we've managed to isolate, taking out the tidal effects from this data. So all the data we'll be looking at through the country is within that range of mean sea level, and we've tried to isolate those tidal effects. We then generate yearly composites using a water index, and we can apply the sub-pixel methodology to, to these yearly comp composites to extract our uh, mean sea level annual shorelines, which is the top right image you can see. Once we have those shorelines, we can then start looking at trends and rates of erosion and accretion. You can see erosion in the red, and you can see accretion in the blue, which corresponds obviously to the shorelines, and we can start looking at the different behaviours around the, around the country. These products, uh, we deliver them with a scale dependent um, dependency, so that we can look at different features at different scales. So at a national scale, we can start looking at summary trends of erosion, which is red and blue accretion again. As we zoom in a bit closer, you can start seeing more statistics around the, the rates of erosion and accretion. Zoom in even more, we start to see the trends in shorelines running across the 30 years from purple through to yellow. As we get very much closer into the data set, you can start seeing the yearly attribution of these shorelines. Now, obviously, all these individual data sets can be downloaded by a user as well as in web services to be analysed for their purposes. So just to look at a couple of the things that we've seen in the data sets as, as we've been um, moving toward publishing. Uh, Western Australian Department of Transport recently released a hotspots um, report looking at coastal erosion across the state. One of those areas that they identified was a place called Port Beach, which is near Perth, Australia. And you can see Port Beach has um, got an erosion almost at about two metres per year. And it's very close to infrastructure and it's being exacerbated by these big climate events. You can also see to the southwest of the beach is that the port has actually had land reclaimed in sort of stages as you move through time. There's a clear correlation with that and the erosion effects we're seeing. And we've been able to actually map our erosion um, hotspots through our method. And we're comparing them to the um, engineering uh, based uh, analysis that the uh, Department of Transport did. We've got a very close correlation with the hotspot they had identified. 
We can also capture general geomorphic change. So this is an island of the North Great Barrier Reef, and we can actually see it's um, migrating north at almost two metres per year, and this has implications for for charting. It has implications for developing island nations when you want to monitor shorelines at this scale. On the right here, you can see the entrance to Moreton Bay, which is near Brisbane, Australia. And you can see over the 30 years, the sand spits and, and, the, and Swan Bay to the north has actually changed shape uh, significantly to the, to the point where it's almost unrecognisable from, from the geomorphic shape it was 30 years ago. And a good example of anthropogenic change, both as uh, intervention by humans with being the source of the problem and also whether or not we can monitor the effectiveness of any actions, remedial actions, is on the New South Wales-Queensland border um, near the Tweed River. So back in the 60s, there were a couple of uh, breakwaters installed around the mouth of the Tweed River. And this reduced the sediment supply of the sand coming up from the south and replenishing those northern beaches. Now those northern beaches are part of the Gold Coast in Australia, which is a iconic beach location, so losing those beaches wasn't an option. So in the 1990s, there was a replenishment program put in to pump sand from the southern beaches through to the north. And you can see quite clearly here, we've been able to see this clear effect of the erosion of those southern beaches that that sand is pumped through and the accretion and the replenishment of the beaches to the north. Now we also reached out to a range of different government, state government and local government sources to get validation data and they've um, kindly supplied that to us in multiple formats. And on the right there, we've gone back to our old favourite at the start for, for Narrabeen Beach to see how our, our full model um, correlates, to the, correlates to the validation data and we're quite happy with the results we're getting through time. And this is another example where we've, where we've got good correlation results from the validation data. This is at an erosion hotspot um, called Stockton Beach in New South Wales. This has had erosion going on for many years and there's mitigation efforts in place and a monitoring campaign, hence all the validation data. Some interesting things of note you can see in the left panel up north of the beach, you've got a rock wall that was built, um, which has actually started to mitigate against that early erosion, which was happening in the late 90s. Down south, you can actually see that the erosion is continuing in quite a linear fashion, almost at the rate of one metre per year. And given the, this is very close to a, um, a caravan park, you can see down there too. And given what we're seeing with the validation data and our product, we're quite confident that what we're seeing is, is, is accurate. Another thing this uh, data has the potential to do is to help sort of supplement the investment that's being made by state governments in these type of monitoring programs. So Western Australia, Department of Transport again, has been doing aerial uh, photogrammetry surveys for many years, trying to you know, capture this kind of coastal change. Obviously that's expensive, so they do it once every five years or so. By doing a yearly shoreline, we can actually supplement that, and we can start to help provide a clearer picture of these different rates of change, whether the changes between years are gradual or they're event-based, and we can really become a complementary data set um, alongside the, what they're doing from aerial photography. And what we're moving into into the future is now trying to see whether or not we can examine different kind of climate drivers in this context. So beach er erosion across the Pacific Ocean is driven by ENSO, um, the Southern Oscillation Index, which affects La Nina and El Nino, has different effects on beaches. And these events are forecast to become much more extreme and frequent in, in the future. So what we want to see is if there's correlations with the different types of erosion and accretion patterns we see in our beaches based on these different kind of climate drivers, which if they're happening more often, might start to enable us to learn what might happen in our beaches, especially on the eastern coast in moving into the future. So in summary, uh, DA Coastlines, a continental scale product in Australia, we're providing annual mean sea level shorelines and coastal change metrics for the past 30 years. We're hoping to release this as a product by the end of 2020. Uh, this will be an open source product. Uh, we're thinking the code will also be available. And in that time, before release, we're really looking to focus on stakeholder feedback, establish this feedback loop of validation and engagement at the state and local level, because really these are the people that are at the coalface of having to deal with these problems. So we need the product to be something that can help them. And then we're also aiming as one of our priorities to transfer the method, the method internationally. And that's how I guess this ties into some of these geo activities. This is through initiatives such as DA Africa, and we're also involved with the newly established Seals Coast program, so looking to see if we can take this time and methodology and establish it somewhere else, perhaps where we've got an ODC implementation. That's it for me. I'm happy to take any questions. Um, people can shoot me an email if they want to be kept up to date with the release schedule of the product, um, and I'll be taking questions in the session after this. Thank you.